Right, um, if anyone has a hand with their homework in, you are naughty and uh, I'll have to take off you later. Okay, um, so next week he doesn't need a lot of introduction. Um, he's done a fantastic Reading Geek speak uh, talk before on uh, how, from a security perspective, to kind of cover up if you're having an affair or something like that. <laughs> and introduce Alec Muffet. Precisely the reason I didn't want him to introduce me. Um, right, uh, Jim asked me to fill in a slot uh, last week, late last week, and said that mm. I could basically do anything, so long as it was vaguely about the future. And I deal in security a lot, so I deal in security threats. And the um, thing is, this is a bunch of issues. It's, it's barely a talk. It's just been thrown together over a matter of few days. Uh, mm. Things which have been floating around in my head. I think we're all at tremendous risk. And I think that we are all part of the problem. So when I say we're a huge threat to the net, it's not in the way you expect. It's not like everybody's phone is suddenly going to rise up as a collective intelligence and overthrow mankind. Skynet. Exactly. Um, the problem is uh, two parts, you and your phone. And the first part is you, which is an intensely human aspect of this potential threat as I see it. Everything weaving together into an issue, what I think is an issue. Um, firstly, we're human. We have knowledge. We have memory. And uh, these are very fundamental things to us. Um, for those of us who are over the age of 30-odd, uh, do you remember phone books? <laughs> yeah. Actually, here, here, here's probably a quicker test. Um, most people have got a mobile phone in this, ha in this room, I would imagine. Okay. Um, just... Presumably, a lot of you, not all of you, but a lot of you will have spouses, other half, significant others, and so forth. Can you remember, off the top of your head, the last four digits of their phone number? Yeah, yes. Mix. It's, I'd say about 50-50, giving the murmurs I've got. Not everybody, but... Uh, the reason is that you have to remember a number, and in the old days, what you would have done is had a phone book with many numbers in it, and when you wanted to call somebody, you'd look them up in the directory, get the number, and call them on it. Um, nowadays, we tend to use our phone to bypass this process. We've gotten the directory out of the loop for a bunch of reasons. They were, they were old, they got out of date, they were expensive, they had to be in specific places and were a paint query. Um, they were full of bugs, people ripped out pages of them in public phone boxes. It was hassle, all told. Uh, so nowadays, your phone helps you remember the numbers so that you can ignore the phone book. Everyone with me so far? Okay, now, IP addresses. 8.8.8.8. Google what? DNS. Yeah, okay, so we're talking to the hardcore geeks here. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, uh, aside from the well-known ones within your household, within your family of 192.168.1.1 or .254 or whatever it is, or a selection of ones which you have to commit to memory because they're important to you to debug with, by and large, you still use this DNS, this phone book, this directory, to look things up. Uh, your computer is not yet, in the way that your phone is, caching IP addresses or finding some way to bypass the big, nasty, white, soaked DNS book thing which is rotten <laughs> in the corner and is subject to an awful lot of controls, which we'll come back to later. Uh, secondly, your phone. Let's talk about your phone and the capabilities of it for a second. In fact, I'll talk about my phone, which is Samsung Galaxy S2. Love it to bits. bits. It's the first phone I've actually loved for absolute yonks. Um, it's got a... Remember how many slides I've got about loving my phone. Um, <laughs> it's got a 1.2 gigahertz dual core processor. It's got 32 gigabytes of uh, flash storage. It's got another two gig of working set. Uh, it's got networking. It's got 3G, uh, HSDPA, Wi Fi, and stuff. <clears throat> That's a fairly significant computer. As I wrote in a couple of slides earlier, I used to run universities which combined had less compute power than that. Um, also, my phone has bi-directional 20 megabit lines to the internet, which is perhaps a little less typical, uh, but that's what happens when I visit Tech Hub in London, and I've got a um, N 
band wireless and I've got the world's fastest DSL which is 1.5 gig bi-directional coming into Tech Hub and it's shared by 30 or 40 gigs whoever is on site. So let's go back and think about it for a minute. 1.2 gig dual core, 32 gigs of storage, 20, me 20 megabit bi-directional. I've rented stuff off of EC2, which has got less power than that. I've run computers less powerful than that for major league web servers. And it's my phone. Isn't this a bit strange? Well, yes, and we'll continue with the strangeness. Because if you use a wonderful little tool on Android to go and dig into what network interfaces you've got, you see I've got a real IP address there, 31.106.0.240. That's with T-Mobile. Uh, so I have real network interfaces running at 20 megabits. And if I attack my machine at home, it actually has traffic coming from that IP address, which is in its own way kind of cool. My phone trying to hack into my machine at home. Um, if we go into the router table, uh, you can see it's got a proper uh, .1 router on a slash 24 subnet. These are all technical terms for routing, but basically what I'm trying to get at here, it's much like your average PC or server. However, when you trace route all the way to Google, in the middle, well, sorry, between six, slot number two and slot number six are lots of 10 addresses, 10 dots, which means those are RFC 1918 private address spaces. This is a highly technical thing, which I've just said, but basically what I'm getting at here is that my powerful little server, let's stop calling it a phone, is attached behind a DSL style NAT firewall, little thing that you might find at home. It's much bigger because it's T-Mobile, but it means that there is something separating me from the net. Something which arbitrates and filters what is allowed out and more importantly, what is allowed in. There's very little on my phone which listens to the net at large. Very little which is listening for inbound stuff. This is a device which talks to the net and requests stuff. This is a consumer device. This is a client device. This is something which isn't expected to be talking to the net. But it's phenomenally powerful. It's more powerful than the machine on which I run my weblog. So your phone is powerful enough to be a server. It is thoroughly connected, very efficiently, 24 by 7, at varying bandwidths, admittedly, but peaking up to something utterly phenomenal, especially when you're walking around at home and you've got Wi-Fi and high-end DSL or cable or something. But it's hideously underutilized. It's just waiting for me to do stuff and downloading stuff that I request. So what? What's the big issue here? Well, this is where we come back to the first half of the talk. There's things like censorship, which upset me. Topics like domain filtering. This is something that you get in repressive regimes like Saudi Arabia <laughs> and Ireland. <coughs> no joke, seriously, they actually do block what domains you can go to. You, the government passes something down to the ISP and says, you're not allowed to access this domain. Sorry. No, we, we don't like it for a variety of reasons. And you think it doesn't happen here? Oh, it does happen here, but we can talk about IWF and so forth later. I just thought that was a nice just juxtaposition. <laughs> if, if you don't get too personal about the country that you're in at the time, it makes a better joke. <laughs> um, and then there's also, speaking of jokes, uh, anti NS domain seizure, which is the, we don't like your domain. Oh, this one is in Britain. You're happy now. Um, You've been to. Uh, we don't like your domain. We're going to wipe you, Mr. Website, off of the face of the internet. So that's as opposed to stopping people looking the phone number up. This is removing them from the phone book. So did that um, work with Wikipedia? Come back to that. That's oh, right, Wikileaks. Uh, come back to that too, if you like. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the threats, the DNS system, the phone book of the internet. The other one is what I call network isolation, a case of divided we stand. If we are more diverse, if we are spread around, but able to talk to the real internet. What I'm getting at here is that if my internet access through my phone is akin to my home network behind a NAT firewall, where I don't really have unmediated access to the internet, I'm in a position where some bastard can switch me off really easily. I have to go through a choke point, and that choke point is a point of potential control. Direct communication on the internet is what made it strong. The ability 
to bounce packets around from a variety of, over an enormous variety of paths, but effectively to enable point-to-point -point communication between me and a machine in California, me and a machine in South America, me and the moon and back, whatever it would be. So why is your phone natted? It's not security. It's not because the client, albeit we had the talk earlier about Android being evil hacker platform akin to Windows. It's not that, because otherwise every time you connect to a sufficiently sized cyber cafe, you are at massive risk because your Wi-Fi network would be equally, uh, provide an equal hackery manner to get into your phone. Um, your phone is natted and firewalled instead for another reason, because it's what people expect. Because of the resource constraints we've got on the internet at the moment, because we don't expect to have telcos providing a service for people to be a server whilst walking around in the city. So if I was going to summarize the whole of my talk, uh, and I would try to do it in three sentences, first question is, Mike, why can I not ping your phone from any point in the world? Uh huh. You would be able to do more with more with a full connectivity, bi-directional, where you were actually part of the internet. Because thirdly, network access, browsing, is not the same as network connectivity. The moment you are walking around with, pardon me, a condom over your phone. <laughs> it only allows, in fact, it's not even a condom, it allows one way, not five hours. <laughs> yeah, this is not really working. <laughs> As I say, this is the first time I've given this talk, I'll need to work on that metaphor. <laughs> but until this situation changes, you and your phone are promoting inferior connectivity. Bad sex. Um, it's not, you are not able to run peer-to-peer -peer servers properly on your phone. Skype, for instance, reaches out to a proxy and then has traffic come back. You can't have straightforward inbound, I'm running a Skype server on my phone stuff. You can't do that for BitTorrent. You can't do that for any other service. You can't host a web server on your phone, which people could connect to. And admittedly, they've been pulling stuff over 3G. But, you know, you might want to compress stuff down or just have just a trickle of data, an RSS feed, say, which would allow people to know where to retrieve something out, out from out in the cloud somewhere else. It would be really, really kind of cool to have a proper server in your pocket. You don't have that. And so, therefore, you and your phone are part of the problem. What are the solutions to this? Firstly, <laughs> IPv6. No more scarcity of addresses, certainly. No more arguments, we're running out of addresses and therefore we'll inflate the price phenomenally. No. No. It, 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 as you say, it, NAT is not a security mechanism. NAT is not a firewall. Anybody who tells you I don't have NAT, uh, therefore I'm insecure, wrong. No. Packet filtering is a firewall, not NAT. But, yeah, IPv6, a slash 48 should be big enough for anybody. That's 281 quadrillion devices in your home with IP addresses, approximately. <laughs> think you'll get away with that. <laughs> Alternates, uh, alternatives to DNS to address the whole phone book problem. There are several out there. There's a peer-to-peer -peer pseudo domain, which is being worked on. Frankly, I don't think it's going to go very far, but there's a bunch of people trying the same thing. I encourage this. There's also better DNS, like DNSSEC, which stops people forging DNS services. <coughs> stops people lying about what the IP address for Amazon.co.it or AU or something is. Uh, because the website, the, sorry, the uh, domain server higher up the chain has a cryptographic attestation of the stuff it's handing out. Problem with this is US government doesn't like it. Hollywood doesn't like it because it stops the US government blacklisting uh, domain servers and stealing domains and saying, ah, oh, yes, we have taken over this domain. Here is a big FBI logo or something like that. Can't do that, doesn't work, if you're running proper security on DNS. Bit of a pisser when you've got the government trying to stop you being secure. <laughs> Tor. If you haven't found out about Tor, find out about Tor. Really useful technology. Internally, it doesn't give a hoot about DNS. Externally, it's just giving the internet a semi-anonymizing service, which is really useful. But the space within Tor is essentially a peer-to-peer-ish cloud of communication and of file serving and data, which has no heed to this hierarchy which they're trying to control. 
But the real solution to all of this stuff is actual demand. Try and talk to telcos and providers saying, wouldn't it be nice if I could serve stuff off my phone and it wasn't just to my home network, but perhaps was to the internet at large. For the moment, and until this sort of massive uh, shift in mindset comes about, the best you can hope for is that your phone will drill out to a machine on the internet and set up a reverse proxy over a TCP connection, which frankly sucks. It's network access, it's not network connectivity. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we can do questions. Does anyone have a question? Yeah. Oh, I, oh, we've heard a lot from you. Over there. Oh, hello. Who else besides you knows all this stuff? <laughs> the question is, who else aside from me knows all this stuff? I could actually make a bunch of statements like this. Have you seen, if you have not seen, you should see, Cory Doctorow's talk that he pimped on Boing Boing a few days ago about the battle against general purpose computing. It was presented at the Chaos Communications Summit around December 29th, so if you go back to Boing Boing or if you put Cory Doctorow YouTube general purpose into Google, it should prop up. That's an allied kind of talk. What I would like to see is my general purpose computer phone able to talk to the internet at large, and it can't yet. And I think that sucks for the reasons I've explained. If you think about it, how many people in, these, in this room are network geeks? How many people think that this is in retrospect stunningly obvious? Yeah, it is, it's just, I want. My phone, the Android box, which is akin to Windows and horribly insecure. Yeah, you're right, it is. It's like any other computer. Kudos, good talk, first talk. Um, but it's actually Linux under the hood with a big fat Java shim on top of it. Um, that's a reasonable base to run software off of. Go for it. Next question. How about the fact that they charge you for all the data in and all the data out? Uh, they don't me. I've got a flat fee. Moreover, and what I was using the 20 megabits, it's free. Web it's a web server. I could set a policy on my IP filters, which you can get, or IP chains, which you can get on there, because it's Linux, and say, when I'm connected over this interface, go for it, web server. When I'm wandering around and my bandwidth drops, forget it, not going to web server. Does we have solutions for that sort of stuff. Does your, does your flat fee cover everywhere around the globe that you might travel? No, it doesn't. But then I only do that for about three weeks a year. Do you? More? Uh, well then. No, but a lot of people don't realise. I'm, I'm not where. interested in a lot of people, I'm interested in the majority of people. That sounds like a brush off, but let's be honest, there's a lot to be said for the 80 20 rule. Uh, how many teenagers who, oh, I've got this really wicked video on my phone, I want to share it with you, Mac. Ooh, here, uh, here's neat hack of the day uh, Mac users. Mac users who use iChat. Yeah. Same here. One useful thing that I found in iChat, which was um, while reading up about AirDrop on Lion, if you fire up iChat from 10.5 onwards, it's got a bonjour self-discovery mode. Basically, everybody on your local area network can chat to each other over iChat without a central server, without anything. It's all point-to-point, -point, peer to peer direct. You can drag and drop files between you at phenomenal speed. Uh, it is unmediated communication with no central point of authority dead useful for shifting a 200 meg file from one machine to another without faffing around with flash drives. Uh, free tip, that is direct point-to-point -point communication. What if I could do that across the entire span of the internet? I can if I'm on a proper server. My phone is currently missing a pair of legs. I, I was gonna, the point I was going to make was mesh Microphone. <laughs> mesh networking. Now, this, this is coming mainstream. It's going to be. It's in the next 3.1 version of the kernel as a basic kernel service. Uh, uh, there was a really interesting talk um, on um, uh, FOSS Weekly about Village Voice. They're using mesh networking um, to set up uh, phone services in Africa uh, at a village level, where <coughs> basically all the phones in the village talk to each other. There is no central service. And I think that's a really fabulous thing. And I also will just say uh, for the old farts in the room, UUCP. <laughs> I've got a few laughs. 
Um, that's what it was all about, point-to-point -point communication, store and forward. Uh, I've got some implementation of that on my OLPC One Laptop Per Child X01. I wish mesh networking well. I hope it doesn't wind up as another protocol that goes in the bin because essentially it's not TCP. But it's a really cool idea. Time for one more. So there's another problem behind this kind of messing around the network and where the packets go across. It's rent innovation in the protocol. Right? If you go and put these tweaks in the network like they're doing here, your new slightly different forms of TCP won't get through anymore. Mm -hmm. You get stuck with UDP, you get stuck with TCP, parent form, and that's it. So one of the few things we did in Microsoft past life was we were looking at multi-part TCP. So you have two, you had a device like this with two network connections. And you opened up a socket on one, stand TCP on one, did a bit of negotiation, and then you opened up the second one on the second group. Mm -hmm. So if you, you move between different things, you could go. A number of mobile networks break this because they dick with the TCP packets that are going through the network. They've mapped some of them to some other stuff too. Mm -hmm. It breaks a lot of this stuff. Um, by messing around the network like this, yes, the mobile folks gain some benefits of cash and other things, so they can save some money. But we lose the ability to innovate at the protocol level and be stuffed with TCP and UDP for a long time to come. I, I agree, I'm very sympathetic to that. Remind me, please, audience, uh, name of the movement for um, uh, political prevention of differentiation of you cannot connect to Google unless uh, you pay extra money, you cannot connect to it at this bandwidth and speed. Neutrality. Net neutrality, yes, thank you. Uh, mental block for the moment. The thing is, somebody once recommended to me that net neutrality was rubbish, essentially, because what they said we actually needed was bit neutrality. The idea of being able to ship a stream of bits from one place to the other and not really care about it. And from what you're saying, that's exactly the truth. Yeah, the end to end on. yeah. which is what we want, really. Of course, you can always synthesize a stream of bits over TCP, but that kind of defeats the point. Thank you very much. We done? Thank you. Okay, that's it for uh, this evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, the, we hold it on the second Tuesday of the month. Next month, that means it's the 14th of February. Um, you're allowed to bring your significant other. <laughs>